Well, welcome everybody. We have a fascinating program for you today. I, I, you need to stay here for the whole bit of it because we're going to be talking about communicating with this ultimate source of wisdom with the unseen therapist. It, literally, we're going to be talking about ways with some seasoned experts here about how to talk with God. And that's all part of our, our, our advanced training. It's also, you know, part of that is given to you in the, my book, The Unseen Therapist and, and so on. Uh, and these communications are not only with therapeutic questions like, gee, what's behind my, so, my issue with whatever ailment it may be, but also everyday questions like, should I turn right or should I turn left? I'm lost. What now? Should I buy these peaches or those bananas? I mean, how would I respond when this person says so-and-so to me in a conversation? Oh, yeah. All of that, all of that, we can gain, we can tune in. We can communicate with unseen therapists once you've done it well. And that's where our seasoned experts are going to come in to show you how in many, many, many different ways. And it will, it will make a major change. So stay here till the, till the end. I don't even know how long it's going to be because we have a lot to cover here. But there are so many ways to do this and so many things going on and so many opportunities. You don't want to miss, don't want to miss any of them. So let me, um, let me bring everybody on. I hope I do this right. Ah, there we are. Okay, so uh, you may or may not be able to read their names. So Nami, would you raise your hand? There's Nami and Anne. All right, and Marion, oh. <laughs> and Mary. Okay, they have been they have been students of of the unseen therapist in our optimal EFT course for for years, and they have developed their various various ways of of doing all this. I want to start off myself, and they're, but they're going to do most of the talking here. But I I want to give you an idea first about how everybody who who gets involved and starts walking up our stairway to miracles with the unseen therapist and reads my book and so on is already learning how to communicate with the unseen therapist. Example in the book at the end, there's something called the personal peace procedure. It's an introductory way of taking a specific event that's bothersome to you, handing it to the unseen therapist and getting some resolution. And even though it's an intro version of that, many people start getting results. So for example, you have some memory with an abusive parent, let's say, when you were age six or something like that, still bothers you now when you think about it. All right, personal peace procedure has you hand that over to unseen therapist in ways that are described. And then you let unseen therapists work with it. And afterwards you see whether or not you got improvement. You may have gone from an eight intensity on a zero to 10 scale to let's say a three or a two or a zero or something. Whatever that was, it's important to recognize you just communicated with the spiritual dimension. You just talked to God. You talked to the unseen therapist. It wasn't done over the breakfast table where, you know, you're talking in English or, you know, pass the bacon or that kind of thing. Okay. It comes about in different ways, different versions of communication. But in that case, you just communicate. You ask unseen therapist, here's my issue that I'm still wor worried about or worked up about. Hand it over to you. Here's the result. You asked, got a result. That is a communication. It's, it's a beginning one for us but it's very important. So with that in mind, that's one example. I know the rest of you guys have lots of examples, but Marion, why don't you kick it off for now and let's just get the ball rolling. Okay, be happy to. So the first point I just wanted to make is that the unseen therapist communicates with different people in different ways. We all have different modalities at which we get information. So some of us are more visual and we're more likely to see an image. Some of us are more likely to hear things. Um, so just notice about yourself how you usually get information. And sometimes you'll get information in more than one way from the unseen therapist. I know for me, I get in all ways, but I'm primarily visual and I'll hear words. But er again, everybody's different. And so you have to look out for the ways that you get your information. 
So the first way I was thinking is that for me, it's often visual. And as Gary said before, that it can be for the most everyday mundane things that you might ask a question of the unseen therapist. For instance, not that long ago, I was having a conversation with Gary after I had been sick and very nauseous and I couldn't eat. And I finally gained my appetite back. And he said, what do you want to eat? And he mentioned a few things that clearly were not what I wanted to eat. So I tuned in with the unseen therapist and an image of a pear came into my mind and I could almost taste the pear. Now, I don't know what it was about that particular fruit that it, it came to my mind, but it was clearly what my body needed. And I knew it the moment that image came in my mind. So it's something very concrete, very simple. But sometimes it could be something more abstract. Like, uh, for instance, I was working with a woman who I had never met before. She was coming in for the first time. I didn't know anything about her. And sometimes I will tune in with the unseen therapist before I see someone for the first time and ask, is there something I need to know about this person? And very often I get a visual image. And in this case, it was an image of a red rose. I had no idea what it meant, but I knew from experience that it was gonna be meaningful. So the woman came in, she was very shy, very withdrawn. She could barely make eye contact with me. And she certainly didn't seem like a beautiful rose. So listening to her story, I, I began to hear that she had grown up homeless, living in homeless shelters with her parents. And um, it was a very difficult life. And as she was talking, the image of the rose started to change in my mind to a rose growing in a very weeded, vacant lot. And it became clear to me that this woman had the potential to be, to blossom despite what she'd gone through. And that in fact is what happened in the therapy. Um, as we, we worked, she blossomed into this beautiful rose. Now, eventually I probably would have realized that, but being cued into that the very first time I met her allowed me to gain information as to where to go with her and what we needed to do. And that was just wonderful. And that was a visual communication from, um, from the unseen therapist. So I'm sure there are other people who've had those kinds of experiences. Anybody else? I well, I think what I'd like to talk about is um, not just the type of experiences, but in the beginning, when you haven't had any experience, the kind of um, period of time where you're trying to connect, you want to believe that you can have a connection, but it's not working or you, you doubt yourself or whatever. Um, I personally, in the beginning, it was really, really difficult for me. Um, I kind of thought of th this, Yes, Gary. Oh, sorry. I was gonna, I was just going to echo Mary. Ah. What, that what you just said is echoed by almost every newcomer because yeah. it is so strange. It is so new. You mean you're going to talk to this woo woo unseen therapist and where is she? Well, she's in here. Well, you know, I don't see her. I mean, yeah. you know, where where is she? So now we're talking about communicating with somebody. You don't even know what she looks like. Okay, uh, because she doesn't look like anything. Okay. So we're actually communicating, but we're not aware of it often. And so it's, it's what you're going to say, Mary, is so important because just about everybody listening in, I'm guessing, okay, mm -hmm. um, has doubts about this. Mm -hmm. and, and it does take experience. It does take practice. May I see nodded heads, ladies, okay? <laughs> Before before you get there, and that's what you're going to unfold here. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but please, Mary, go ahead. No, it's fine. It's it's good you said that because um, I think most people would be working on their own at home, trying to figure this out. You know, uh, trying to understand what the connection would be, and plus, most people have a lack of confidence starting something new. So that lack of confidence would come in and play the part of, you know, the doubting Thomas and telling you you're not doing it correctly and and uh, maybe you need to have, like, you know, lots more 
spiritual experience or maybe the loving connection or whatever must be much more important. So this can just prevent us from believing the messages that are coming coming in, you know? So. The, the, I'm sorry, Mary. The other thing that, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that happens, this is my experience, especially with newcomers, is they think this is not going to work mm. unless there's a Hollywood moment involved. <gasps> If I'm going to be speaking with the unseen therapist, I've got to get warm fuzzies. I've got to, I've got to hear music. I've got to No, You just get a notion here. Sometimes you get a feeling mm -hmm. yes. and you have to, you, you eventually get used to, ah, what that is. Anyway, sorry to interrupt again, but I want to emphasize. No, that. You're, you're grand. The thing is, whether we get an image or we hear a voice, the first thing we're going to think is, well, I'm just thinking that or, or, or that came from that movie I saw last night or, you know, all the doubts going to come in all the time. How am I going to know which voice or which image is actually the answer to the question that I posed, you know? So that's the biggest, that was the biggest challenge for me in the beginning. And I'm sure most people have gone through the same thing, you know, and sure. really, um, I, I know I'm always talking about groups, but really it was when I was working on my own, I had too many doubts and it was when I started working with these fantastic people in groups and I saw how they spoke to the unseen therapist and the confidence that they had that I realized, okay, well here I, I have this space, this sacred space, the safe space where I can test it out. And I was really nervous in the beginning, you know, to say, well, I saw this strange image. Does that mean anything to you? The person whose um, question we were working on. And astonishingly, very often, more and more, it was actually meaningful to that person. So that boosted my confidence. I just wanted to state that in the beginning because the lack of confidence, the lack of practice means you have the lack of confidence. And the more you practice, you can't exactly practice that with clients if that's your only situation because you don't want to mess up and you don't want to make a fool of yourself or et cetera, et cetera. So the practice group is a fantastic place to practice or practice with a friend. You know, it doesn't have to be a practice group if you're not in the optimal EFT community yet or, or don't want to be or whatever the reason is. But practice with someone who you can trust and who will take it lightly, whatever crazy image that you have come to you or whatever the message is so that you can start getting a feel for it and start saying, OK, well, that worked, that didn't. In that place, it must have been the unseen therapist who was speaking to me. And in that place, it was just my crazy thoughts. And that builds your practice. One of the things, one of the things that uh, you, you pointed out that I, I want to emphasize again is if, if you're a newcomer, particularly if you're a therapist or you're trying to do this with someone else and you don't have this confidence yet, and you get some kind of a notion or some kind of a message, but you, you don't really know where you are and you don't want to look bad. Okay. When I was starting out doing this, I would say I would get this notion. And I would just say to the client, I keep getting this notion that something about your sister, something about this, something about that. Does that fit? Mm. And well, I'll wait. if they say, well, yeah, well, then off we go. OK, mm -hmm. if they say, well, no. Well, OK, I haven't embarrassed myself. We just mm. go on. OK, mm. so it's a way of just wording it up front, a sort of a pre frame, we would call that mm -hmm. so that you can. Even if you're wrong, <laughs> or or even if that notion you get they don't recognize yet, okay, it may well it may well show up before your session is over, you know, and then you can yeah. introduce it again and and so on. But anyway, yeah. I might want to add to that in that sometimes you can get these notions, or for me it's an image, and hold it in your mind the way I did with that rose. I didn't say anything about what I got. So especially, Mary, it, you know, you say you don't want to practice on clients. Yes, I agree. If it's someone, if you're totally new to it, you might not want to practice on clients, but you might get an image while you're working with somebody and hold it in your mind as a hypothesis. Maybe this is information. Let's see where it leads. Let's see if it makes sense to me later on. So in a sense, you can use it in your work, even at the beginning when you're not confident. And, and Gary, I agree with you. There are times I'll say it as though I, I have this feeling or I keep seeing this. 
I, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's something for me, but, and then I'll, I'll throw yeah. it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it dies, it dies and you go on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Right. Can can I add in there? I, I think that as as the practice um you know evolves and, and you know we, we kind of put our toe in the water and we try it out, that's when a point comes where it's like we start to know that's not me, like that's the unseen therapist. There there is a turning point, I think, comes where there is a difference. I mean, for, for me, when I hear something, it comes from back here, it comes from somewhere back here it's not in my head you know that didn't start off straight away I mean that's something that I've just noticed over time and it's like when it comes from either side but when it comes from back there into my ear um like I know okay that's her and I think the other way she shows up in terms of kind of really confirming that it's her is every once in a while there will be an image or a sentence or a word or something that that just comes into our mind and and you sit there and you go I could not you know like in my wildest imagination I could not have come up with that mm -hmm. you know and so it's she shows us that yes we are on track I mean it's always really good I think to have that discerning question of mm, is this me is this her because we want to stay out of it we want to make sure that we are just that that um that vehicle through which she gets to kind of pass on whatever it is she wants to pass on either to us or to somebody else. So it's really good to always, I think, have that question. Mm, is that me? Is that the unseen therapist? And at the same time, to really allow her to like guide us as we begin to trust more and go, no, that's her. That came from back there. I mean, that's just my way of getting it. Other people would have different ways, you know, or, or, or that thing where you kind of sit back and laugh and go, well, that's got to be hard because in a million years, my imagination couldn't have come up with that one, you know? So, yeah. I have, I have story after story after story about having stuff come up that just doesn't seem to be on point at all. Okay. Nowhere near. I mean, my favorite story, you guys have probably heard it before, but I was doing some surrogate work with the mother of some young man who had acne and what kept coming up for me surrogately, just from, from, I should say, not surrogately, from unseen therapists was the term broken toys. And what that has nothing in my logical mind to do with some kid in college that's 20 years old who cares about broken toys. But it was a biggie because when the kid was very young, his father threatened to break his toys if, you know, and not love him if he didn't do certain things. Okay. You get one of those or two of those or you know a few of those every once in a while that come way out of the blue and there's no way no way on this planet they could ever be coincidence. Mm -hmm. That really gets your attention. And then you start going, you know. And then we come up to the idea of coincidence. Some of these things, well, maybe we were just lucky or it could be coincidence. And that might be even true. But we just get so many coincidences that after a while, the coincidences excuse doesn't float. Listen, I, I'm remembering something. I was reading you guys write-ups that you were sending me before we did this re recording. And some of you were, I, I forgot which one. You were talking about you would hear a, a song. Oh. Uh, was it you, Marion, that was hearing yeah, the song? It was me. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Talk, talk about it. you'd hear you would hear a song. Talk about it. Well, that happens to me and to people I've worked with. But I was very stressed and not feeling well a number of years ago, and I was working with the unseen therapist about what do I do? What's wrong? What do I need to attend to? And instead of answering me in words or picture, a song came in my mind. And those of us who are old enough to remember Simon and Garfunkel's 59th Street Bridge, um, it went, slow down, you move too fast. You got to make the morning last. Yeah. I knew <laughs> that's that was my answer. I was just running around and hadn't taken any time to take care of myself and stuff. And it was wonderful. It made me laugh, um, which, by the way, she does have a sense of humor, which you'll see. As we talk about it, sometimes what you get is funny. Yeah. But it was Who, what, what do you got? What do you, somebody was telling me the other day about this. Maybe it was one of you guys. Something about 
you were asking a question and you got nothing. And that was unusual. You just got a blank. And you end, end up saying, why do I get a blank? And the unseen therapist says, because you're not listening anyway. Me again. Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> There's her sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> and and she, I could picture her in my mind. I could see a smile on her face. It wasn't a judgmental, you're not listening. But <laughs> kind of like, well, you're not going to listen. So why should I answer you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's just telling us our, our, our ego is in place and not listening today. Okay. <laughs> and that's a good message, by the way. Yes. It, you know. it disarmed the ego. Yeah. Yeah. Another thought, I'm just thinking in terms of communicating, it's often, well, my experience was it's often easier at the beginning. And, and even as time goes by, to do it on behalf of someone else. I got much more proficient mm -hmm. at that before I was really able to listen for myself. Um, now that may not be everybody's case, but but I wonder if sometimes that's where people's um, lack of self-belief or irritation comes in or frustration that like I keep trying this and, and I can't get anything. I mean, I think we've all probably heard that I can't get anything. And, and definitely doing it on behalf of someone else, not someone we're kind of deeply attached to the outcome of whatever it is. I mean, if we're very triggered by something going on with someone else, that's a bit like doing it for ourselves. But if we're doing it on behalf of someone we just kind of pair up with or we know so-and-so's got something on and we just say, well, I've, I've nothing to lose. Um, I, I found for me, I've, I was able to... to uh, hear or see or whatever the unseen therapist communication for other people a lot clearer a lot more uh, that I could trust it um just a lot easier full stop um and my own you know communication with her in terms of really trusting it and really hearing her has developed over time and even with my own one when I'm when I'm just having a general I wonder what I need to know about I hear it. If I'm really activated about something, again, it's like if I'm really, you know, I need to know, my God, this is just terrible. Like, like, you know, again, it's like very, very hard. So what I need to do then is say, I'm really activated. Like, <laughs> help calm me down first because I'm not going to be able to hear you or anybody else. Yeah. That, that brings me to something, Anne. Because I know you wrote to me something. You you do something with it when you write, okay? But I want to I want to I want to give a little intro to that first. There's such a thing known as automatic writing, and some people are able to do that. They just they just sit there and start writing. And unseen therapist, God, higher power, or whatever they're tuning into, whatever they call it, they'll start writing out some stuff. People even write out perfect poetry sometimes. Okay. Um, I don't have the skill to do that, or I haven't, I shouldn't say it differently. I have not yet developed the skill to do that. Important way to word that, okay. Mm -hmm. What I do do from time to time is I enjoy writing poetry and I it'll put it on my website newsletter once in a while and, and so on. But when I do it, it comes very easy to me, especially when they're spiritual topics. It's just, it's not perfect. But the, the rhythm comes, the comes the, I may have to look up a rhyming word or two, but it, it flows pretty well. I go back over it. Da, 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 da. And I did have done much faster than you would ordinarily think a poem would be. Well, you got to, does this rhyme with that? And, and how about this cadence? And it just flows. It just shows up that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's not, that's not what you call automatic writing. But I think there's some spiritual stuff behind that mm -hmm. guiding me to write it with whatever skills I've developed. Now you, Anne, do something a little different still. Talk about that, could you? Yeah, um, and it, yeah, I, so when I was first communicating with the unseen therapist, I would do it on behalf of, particularly if I was doing it on behalf of someone else, close my eyes, whatever would happen would happen. I'd open my eyes and, you know, make a few notes because before I forget it, I want to be able to tell somebody. Somewhere along the line, without me noticing, what changed was when I would say, Leo, let's close our eyes, connect to lovely moment, let's go in with the unseen therapist. I would pick up the pen and I will end up with maybe a page or two written by the time that other person opens their eyes. And I, I mean, obviously I move the pen, but what comes through it completely comes from her, completely. 
you know, occasionally, which is brilliant, even to the point of a Freudian slip in the way she makes me write something. Like that happens with, you know, reasonable frequency. Um, you know, like the other day I was writing, I, I was I was doing what she was doing, you know, I was just kind of writing something as I was in on behalf of somebody. Um, and I thought, because, because you know, I, I see where the sentence is going. I thought the word was going to be, I can't remember what it was, doing. And she wrote the word boring, you know, which had a whole, when I reflected that back to the person afterwards, it opened a whole other door of a really boring aspect of their life that they hadn't even kind of named that. So, so that's just a detail. But yeah, I will end up with, it could be a you know an A4 page written. And at the end, when we come back, I'll ask the person what they got. They'll tell me and then I'll say, would you like to hear what I got? And, and I generally read it out. And uh, I, I will say if it lands, it lands. And if it doesn't, but it, feels like it completely comes through her even pauses of pen while she tries to think or she goes in and she does something else so yeah yeah fascinating fascinating okay and I think what I want to add is that I think we all can connect and you just have to keep trying and trying and trying and if you ask her she will provide an answer in ways that you might not expect, right? So I also tend to hear her, and I've realized I hear her in my right ear quite clearly now, but I've had like thoughts or ideas come into my mind, um, and visually too, she'll show me visual images, um, but also messages from others, right? In a practice group, other people give me messages. So if you pay attention to your family members or friends around you, do they have messages for you that would be helpful or resonate to you at that time? And also feelings, like I tend to feel in like chakras usually, but like feel emotions or feel things that I need to work on. So even though I'm not directly asking her, you know, what's bothering me today, it might be that I'm feeling a lot of, you know, heaviness or fear or anxiety in my heart that day or something to cue me to, you know, work on it more. But to ask her over and over again, she will provide what you need if you're open to it so to mm. if I can't connect her with her in the morning because I'm busy and bothered maybe that night when it's quieter I'll ask again um she's shown me too like numbers and like images like my sister brought over monarch butterfly eggs and the whole transformation of the egg all the way to the butterfly like that's very symbolic of like the transformation that I'm trying to put into my life at the moment right so symbols as well I think to pay attention to and like echoing Anne's statement of how do I know? How do I know what I'm hearing or seeing or is really her? At the beginning, I was constantly asking her, like, is it, did I make this up? Is this you? Like, I couldn't distinguish. So I, my one question over and over again, I ask is like, did I make this up? Could I have in my humanness have made this up? And truthfully, I can't make up the things that the unseen therapist like sends me. So then that helped me trust her. And I just kept doing it over and over again, just trusting her and trusting her. And I think you just have to keep trying. You have to keep asking and just don't give up because I think everyone can connect in many different ways to just trust. And I, it's so useful. Like the other day, my kids, my kids are fighting. <laughs> what else is new? And <laughs> I was getting a little bit frustrated because they keep physically hitting each other too. And like someone's been kicked in the mouth, et cetera, tears or flowing screams or <laughs> echoing. So I asked the unseen therapist, like, please give me the words that might help like my one son. And please give me the words that might help my other son. Cause they need different, I think different words, different tones of voices, different, you know, settling techniques. And I asked her just to see, and she just sent me words and it, significantly quickened the amount of time it took to calm things down. Apologies were made and then off they went to play again. So I'm realizing more and more that it really can be used on a very daily basis in the midst of like speaking with someone that is frustrating me and I'm really upset about. I asked her, I said, please give me the words that would benefit this conversation rather than making it far worse than it needs to be, which often happens when you're in like an argumentative state. So I think just keep trying, 
keep asking her to show, if you want a vision, visual image, like ask her to show you something. If you want to hear something, ask her to open up your ears to hear it, you know? And the other thing I just want to end with is like gratitude, like keep it open in gratitude to say like, thank you for keeping me open to hearing your messages. Like, thank you so much for helping me in whatever way you are, like just keep me open to receiving your messages, right? It might be through something you see on a computer screen. Like Miriam had mentioned, she got the perfect like website just pop up on her screen one day. And like, we just need to be open to it. And I think be grateful that she's sending them, be grateful that we can at some point receive them if we keep on trying. <laughs> That's really nice. And it triggers a couple of thoughts for me, you know, I mean, there's a certain wisdom in this. I mean, just, just to go back to a second, what words would I use for your two fighting children? You know, I mean, there's a wisdom in that. And if you try to rely, re, rely on your own ego stuff, you're going to come blurt out with something that's not going to help. Okay. <laughs> Typically. So when we get to the point where we trust, 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 and we get to the point where it's an you said gratitude, when you're in a constant state of gratitude, not only are you more peaceful, but you're also more gratitude and you're more tuned in to the nonstop wisdom coming from the source. See, the problem is we're not listening. We haven't learned to listen well. We are learning to listen, okay? But our ego takes over and we, 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 we go, we, our ego gets us in trouble <laughs> once in a while. And, and, so, and, so, and so it goes, but I would love to see the day when everybody is practicing like you guys are practicing and getting more and more trust and everyday work with the unseen therapist so that we rely more and more, even to the point of doing it perpetually, always there. And I would love to see not only all of us, our students and so on, but wouldn't it be nice if political leaders all had the very same way to go about. So when they're negotiating and arguing and fighting with other countries or political things and all that stuff, the right words come out. <laughs> the wisdom shows up and we have negotiation and pleasantness instead of bombs and threats, much, much different. The other thing, I, I forgot who it was. I think, I think you said it to me, Nami, in your write-up stuff you wrote to me is that one way to distinguish, and I think others of you echoed this too, distinguish between whether a message you're getting is something you've made up your ego chatter or whatever, or the unseen therapist <clears throat> is whether or not it comes from love. She will never tell you say this to put that person in their place mm -hmm. because that's not loving to do. Okay. That is not a message from her. A, a more loving thing, recognize where they're coming from, pay attention, say this, love. That's a message from unseen therapist. That's one way to distinguish. Yes. That's, that's me talking a lot. Anything more, you guys? Well, well also, go ahead, Mary. Thanks. I just wanted to add in to what Nami had said, because I've been doing the same thing as well um, for the last couple of months with my sons who are teenagers um, and other people around me, just I think what's really important is because you do have that tiny moment, moment of grace where you stop yourself before you blurt out your emotional reaction, whatever's been triggered, whatever the situation may be. And we have developed this habit of speaking to her more and more. Um, to actually say to myself, like Nami was was saying, you know, please, please give me, let me find the right words, you know, so that I, I, I do write by these boys that I don't, you know, spout out loads of stuff that's not going to help anybody. Um, I'm exaggerating it now. I would just say it really simply, please help me to find the right words. But I think what's important is that tiny moment of space. That, that little tiny moment of space is exactly what stops that whole trigger or tornado of, of, of baggage coming up. So I think it's not just that you're asking, but that you make that break in your normal habit of reacting to ask. 
Do you see what I'm trying to say? And I hadn't actually thought about that until until Nami was just speaking and I realized, yeah, that's really important too, you know? And and almost every single time stuff comes out of my mouth when I've asked her that I wouldn't have planned of, uh, on saying that I, I would have needed at least a half an hour to sit down with a pen and paper to prepare it. And you don't have that kind of time in everyday situations. It's just this, what would be the right words? Just this calm, loving, not peaceful. That sounds that sounds wrong. But just this ca these calm, loving words come, and and you you're able to to pass on even the energy of that. Maybe it's not even the words. Maybe it's just the energy of being calm and loving that comes through whatever words come out that allows the other people who you're talking to to be calm and connect to that energy too. And and hence everything is just lovely. That Mary, that reminds me. This is a, a recent experience you know that i've had listening to unseen therapists one of our one of our members nor our newer members is um, riddled that's a good word with cancer all over his body has been there for some time he was told some years ago he only had a few months to live he's managed to manage it until then and i know he's done some work with unseen therapists and i know he's gotten some results He's pleased with that. But I got this message. I got this notion about him. I, I wasn't even thinking about it. It sort of showed up in me. And it doesn't sound very loving at first, but I want to expand on this. He let me, re he let me record this whole session, by the way, so it's going to be there for everybody. His name is Rod. But the notion that I got when I was when I was thinking about how would I approach Rod's cancer? What haven't we done yet that would help kind of thing? And I got a notion that was, did not seem in the service very loving because the notion was Hitler. Okay. Hitler. Well, I don't know if he's Jewish or not. In fact, I didn't even ask him, but Hitler came up in a little different way. And when you see this session that I, did with him you'll see where that comes from and so i had to be i had to be lovingly a little forceful with him because because he was he had this facade we all have facades we all you know put out this thing we want the world to see about us and so on and he's doing that and it, it, it's sort of a look at me i'm supposed to be dead from cancer but i'm not it's my badge da 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 okay I said, you've got a facade and underneath all that, Rod, I suspect there's a Hitler. There's some rage. There's some anger. There's some nasty stuff you don't want to look at. Uh, right on. Right on. And that whole nearly two-hour session was about the Hitler within him. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it will not that kind of anger and that kind of rage, etc., which, by the way, all of us have some piece of, or at least we have the potential for it, whether we act on it. Hitler acted on it, okay? But I see some nodded heads. We recognize it is there. We push it down. We don't act on it. We got a, a, a facade. And so while that seemingly was not very loving, ultimately we had to, I had to punch him in the nose to get there, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, he's been, he's sent me an email here a few days ago. He's going to send me some more, but apparently he's been having, he's been watching this um, uh, session that we did over and over and over and over again. And he says, he's getting all kinds of messages and love and peace. And it's been quiet. And I don't know if that's going to fix the cancer or not, but it's a step in the right direction. That's, but that's my point. It's, it's a loving thing. It's a loving thing, but sometimes it, <laughs> it may have a little punch to it. <laughs> just, yeah. just, so you, just so you know, okay. Long story, but I, I wanted to add that one in here. So. It's important because sometimes we, what we get is not what we want to hear, particularly yeah. personally. We may not want to hear it, but it's always wise and loving and without judgment. And, and without? Without judgment. Without judgment. Yes. Interestingly enough, in this session with Rod that I did, 
even though it may on the surface seem judgmental, he was buying it big time and there was no judgment whatsoever. And we were just, we were putting the real issue on the table. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which you have to do sometimes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I would suspect that many of our clients that are maybe not getting beyond certain physical things that they'd like to get beyond. And they wonder why, because somewhere underneath there, there's the big one, the Hitler yeah. or whatever it is. There's the big one in there. Okay. Got to bring it up. Got to bring it up. Hmm. Okay. Anything more you guys have to offer while we're, while we're here? Yes. <laughs> Please. I have something to add. Um, two things about what Anne said. Um, one is I had a thought, um, Anne, you suggested that you, if you're new to listening to the Unseen Therapist, try it out with some person that you have no um, stake in the answer. And I thought you could take it one step further and just try it with just someone you meet on the street, someone mm -hmm. who is standing in front of you online who looks upset or the person you're who's delivering your mail and just asking the unseen therapist is there something i need to know and do it as a kind of experiment see if it leads somewhere see if it leads to a conversation or in a conversation if it turns out to be meaningful and that's how you begin to build up confidence that you can get information and also as everyone has pointed out as you begin to hear or work with the unseen therapist more, you get to know your style. You mm -hmm. hear it in your right ear, or you hear a voice in your head, or you see something, or things happen. And the more you do this work, even if it's just experimenting when you're out and about, um, the more you'll be able to trust because you find out the information you get was useful. So that mm -hmm. was one thing. Can, can I add? Comment? Yeah. Sorry, I want to add to the trust thing, um, and that is, I think more often than people realize, they do communicate with the unseen therapist because mm -hmm. I don't know if the rest of you have heard this, but often it's like if I'm working with somebody new, they will say, you know, we close our eyes, we, we open our eyes. I say, you know, well, how was that? And say, I didn't get anything. However, <laughs> <laughs> and then like, like five minutes of yeah. you know i remembered when and then this and then that you know so i didn't you know no i didn't get anything from the unseen therapist however wait till i tell you you know what came <laughs> to my mind so this thing of like what's coming from her i think a lot of the times it is coming from her but but we and and people that are new to this can think well that no i got nothing from her but while i was in there with my eyes closed you know this is what came into my mind. And that's, I mean, Gary, as you always say, the unseen therapist is not out there. I mean, it is our own inner wisdom, our own divine part, our own inner guide. I mean, whatever word people have for it. So all we're doing is accessing that. And whether the voice comes from the right ear, the left ear, out there, image in head, you know, at the end of the day, like it's coming from within and we're just trying to connect to that part that's with us 24 hours of every day. Yeah, we're, we're learning to listen, which prompts me to say one other, one other thing and it has to do with something about readiness. I know, I mean, we'd like to be ready 24 seven that always listening, always listening. That isn't the case, but we're trying, we're honing our skills to get there. I'm finding that that the times when I'm listening best is when I'm in a session with somebody, a therapy type session. Somehow or other, I'm getting these notions, this go there, go here, go there. They will say something to me. And just, they'll say it routinely, but it stands out and I get a go there okay, kind of thing. During that environment, I'm ready somehow or other my readiness is there. I don't even have to ask unseen therapists and formally be quiet and listen to that. I don't, it's just there. Okay. My readiness is there. Sometimes I will ask and I may or may not get a current answer if I close my eyes and formally ask. But the next day I may, I may read a headline in a newspaper. I may read something in a book and it is, it's like the words just stand out like they're capitalized or something. Or somebody, I see something on television and the words like they're shouted at me. 
not literally, but they just stand out in this way. There you go. So she will find out, she will find when you're ready, <laughs> which is, which is, there are just times you, you, you're not ready. Okay. That's all there is to it. And so, well, we'll pause. We'll wait. Okay. Here it comes. And the more you you tune into that, the more you recognize that, the more you're really realizing, man, this is wisdom that I shouldn't ever be turning down. We do it anyway. Our egos do that, but we're learning. So anyway, did you have more you wanted to say, Marion or, or Anne? Well, there's something um, akin to what you were just saying. That wasn't what I was going to say before, but um, I was working with someone yesterday. And this is a man who was um, an alcoholism and drug addiction counselor who had burnt out and he was retired. And what we were working on is his life has no meaning to him now. He's bored. He doesn't know what to do with himself. There's no purposeful work. And so he asked the unseen therapist, what can I do? Why am I stuck in this rut? What do I need to do? And he felt like he got no answer. Uh, he just, it fell flat. Usually he gets something, but he didn't get an answer. Two days later, he got a call out of the blue from someone he hadn't spoken to in years who said, we're putting together an outreach program for alcoholics in this beach community. We live near the ocean, known for its alcoholism. And we'd like you to put it together for us and help us organize it and help supervise us. But there'd be no interaction with the alcoholics, which is what had burnt him out. And he realized that that was the answer because that's something he'd love to do. It gives his life meaning. He uses his skills and his interests, but it didn't burn him out. And he said that was the answer. It just took me two days to get the answer yeah. from her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of times that stuff will come and we'll say, oh, well, that was coincidence where we got lucky. Well, perhaps, perhaps. But it happens but it, so often. Yeah, so but it happens. Yeah, it, and maybe some of it's coincidence, but we, we just get too many coincidences to use that label accurate, <laughs> accurately. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, anything more? I'd like to just explain why I keep yawning. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a chronic yawner when we connect to the unseen therapist with the groups. Um, I actually take notes like a prisoner marking off in fives how many yawns they do. Um, I think my most has been about 23 yawns in, in one group session. Uh, when I connect to the unseen therapist, and it's, I think it's because there's four of us. I think it's stronger. That, that's actually a good thing to mention as well. Um, when I'm on my own, it's never as strong as it is when I'm with a group. It's like a meditation or, or anything like that, you know. Um, it's definitely more powerful. And it's not that I'm yawning because I'm tired. I think that I'm just in that loving space, bubble, whatever you want to call it. And things just start getting released, things that are ready to be released. I don't know what they are. I don't care what they are. I don't need to know. They're being released. I definitely think stuff is being shifted. So when I yawn, I know that's a good sign that I'm connected. Mm -hmm. And in fact, now that I think about it, it only ha ever happens when I'm in a group. It never happens mm -hmm. when I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. So I really do think it's the strength of the connection. And one last thing I'd like to add is um, something that I learned from NAMI, in fact, was when I do ask the unseen therapist for you know answers to questions or whatever, I kind of take what I'm given and presume that that's it. But NAMI's taught me to continue asking anything else, anything else. And she may ask that four or five times. And there's a whole richness of stuff that's still available if you keep asking. So don't yeah. just stop on the first question. You know, I, I imagine the unseen therapist sitting there, you know, tapping our fingers, waiting for us to ask anything else. And she's just dying to give us more information. You know, she's not going to give us all the whole thing on the first go. So. Yeah. Well, she'll give us what we can take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or what we can write down fast enough. <laughs> or, what, or what we're ready to hear. Sometimes yeah. we aren't ready to yeah. hear. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, guy. Any 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 other bits of wisdom from you that comes from the wisdom of the unseen therapist? Not right. for now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. I would like to have you. I'm going to close this out right now. I'd like to have you guys just stay on a little bit. We'll talk after this after this broadcast is over. So. To all those listening in, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got a lot out of it. I hope you listen 
more to the unseen therapist. Practice, practice, practice. See you next time. Bye.